This is a great time for biotechnology. Why? People need new medicines. There's loads of molecules out there and nobody knows where to put them. And you've got a bad economy. People want to look for an opportunity to make money. And we all know that people do very well as the economy starts to emerge. So it's a great time and it's a great time to be coming here and be part of a great school that is trying to formalize biotechnology at its school and getting people interested in bringing these molecules out into the world, which is really what it's all about. So I'm going to speak briefly about some of the changes that, that have occurred in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. Um, I took a few minutes before this talk to meet a lot of you in the audience to find out what you are interested in and where you are. So I will try to speak to that. Um, there we go. So, some differences that are immediately apparent are actually driven by science. In the 1960s and 70s, there were lots of small molecules. Uh, for those of you in the audience who don't know what a small molecule is compared to a large molecule, a small molecule is aspirin, Tylenol, Motrin. Thalidomide. A large molecule is a protein. So for those of you on the lab bench who know this, I apologize, but there actually is an important distinction there, not just because it's science, but it has changed the regulatory world and has forced the pharmaceutical and biotech industry to change as well. And there are some devices. From the 1980s to the 2000s uh, and now, we have seen more small molecules we have seen large molecules, including antibodies. How many of you in the labs are working on antibodies? How many of you are working on enzymes? I saw three hands go up. Oh, and, we ha and the director is working on enzymes, too. In the 60s and 70s, we only talked about small molecules. Here, developing antibodies and enzymes is a whole other planet. And I have walked into pharmaceutical companies that have developed tiny molecules, and they have got this great, great, big molecule enzyme, and they don't know what to do with it. And that's why they need people like us to help them understand what these molecules can do. And by the way, from my point of view, they have very different safety profiles, which is a key element. Won't get into too much of that tonight, but it sort of drives things. Um, but there's also now biologics called snake venoms. A lot of the things that are used to thin blood come from ancrod, a snake, come from bats, uh, altiplase, not altiplase, um, dysmotoplase. All of these things have different profiles and have presented tremendous opportunities for companies and have forced them to change because they cannot develop molecules the way they used to they have to think about them very differently and develop them very differently. And by the way, some of them provide opportunities to get a drug approved more quickly. A great example of that in a, in a molecule, clinical trials take between 500 and 5,000 patients depending on what you're developing. In some of these enzymes, the enzyme to help uh, one of the neurologic deficiency diseases they got the drug approved in 20 patients. So a tremendous opportunity. It's just uh, very exciting. There were very few devices in the 60s and 70s. Now there are devices everywhere. What are devices? Devices include glucose machines. For those of you who have friends or family members who have diabetes, how many versions of the glucometer have you seen change? I mean, there have been 20 versions probably in the past five years. Um, by the way, did, just as a quirk, did you know that a leech is used medically and is considered a device? <laughs> it is a device, and therapies are developed around that. Devices are implants into your tissues, in your lungs. There's new biologic devices now where when they used to make an incision across your, th they would sew it up. Now you can put in this device that helps it to heal better. And then the device dissolves after a while. 
Very, very exciting stuff, all driven by science, driven by great uh, found, stuff found in great schools. A lot of the biotech companies that you'll hear about were a professor or a person from a school or academia that had an idea and brought it into the, into the uh, biotech industry. Why did they start a company? Because they knew they needed $10 million to develop it and they had to take it public to, to raise the money. Did they always work? No, but all of you who do experiments on a lab bench know, well, maybe all of yours work. Not all of mine always worked. And my first job, by the way, did I tell you this? My first job at Hopkins was getting rats drunk. <laughs> it's no joke in the laboratory of David, uh, Daniel Drachman, and look where I am today. <laughs> so, um, so, Research and development has very much moved away from Big Pharma. There's a lot of explanations for that. All of you have heard of Merck and Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. They established big chemistry companies that would develop small molecules. To make a long story short, what's happened is they are now shopping around for new molecules, new devices, new therapeutics, and they're shopping at the tiny little companies uh, the people who take an idea, uh, raise some funds, test their molecule, figure out that it may be helpful, and then bring it back to the large pharmaceutical houses to see if they will buy it and then develop it. There are three stages of drug development, phase one, phase two, and phase three. I won't spend too much time in that. But translational medicine, which many of you have heard about and which my introduction alluded to is taking the molecule off the lab bench and putting it into a human. That's a very critical step. It is thrilling. It is very exciting. I learned so much medicine doing, I learned a lot more of that now than when I was on full-time faculty. Um, it's very hard work. You get to partner with really, really smart people and it's very exciting to be able to do that and people like me, what I do for a living is, I'm the accountant, basically. I tell you what boxes to put it in, how to get it through the FDA, how to put, design your experiments. It's not the kind of science you're used to doing where you're answering theoretical questions. I'm just trying to get you into humans. Um, there's an important uh, bullet point on this slide, is that the housekeeping is frequently outsourced, providing an opportunity for small startups. We didn't have this in the 60s and 70s. You had Merck, you had Pfizer, you had Johnson & Johnson. Now, have any of you heard of Paracel? Wow. Covance? RPS? PRA? No hands went up. Why is that important? For some of you looking for a job, I'm looking, there was somebody here speaking about looking for a job, a lot of the companies uh, pharmaceutical companies went and developed drugs and they got blockbuster bl drugs and they built these huge infrastructures that they can't support anymore because their patents are going off. So they took their whole chemistry department and sold it to Covance, for example, one of the companies. Covance is what we call a CRO. Basically, they go to Johnson & Johnson and say, you want us to run your drug trials, we'll run your drug trials. How has that been an advantage to biotech? Well, you don't have to build a big company. You want to do a clinical trial and put it in humans? You can shop around to one of these houses that will help you. They have experience. They hire people like me to help them all the time, but they will help you develop your drugs. And that wasn't available a long time ago. You either had to go to Merck or raise loads and loads of funds. Here, you've got a lot more people around to help you in a nice competitive environment. And Covance is, a, is an example because I know the merger recently. They hired really, really smart people. So for those of you, by the way, who might be looking for a job, just don't, don't shop around just at the pharmaceutical companies. There's a lot of the operational companies that have great scientists and do great work. The other thing that we have now that we didn't have before are the regulations are better and coordinated among the different countries. When I first started, my first job in industry was at Johnson & Johnson. I had to write a letter to the, v, the, the FDA 
to get a written three-page requirement on how to develop a drug in epilepsy, for example. Now, two point and clicks on the FDA website, and you can learn how to develop a drug for rheumatology, epilepsy, stroke, and all of this is coordinated with the international uh, harmonization based in Switzerland and the UK. And two more clicks, and it's been a great help to many people, especially many biotech companies, where they have great ideas, great scientists, who have no clue how to fill out the tax return, have no clue how to get it into a human. And these things are very, very helpful. These are tremendous opportunities. Big Pharma used to do some in-licensing. Now they have whole departments that they want to in-license. By the way, what drives Big Pharma to look for certain drugs? Do they just look for any old drug that makes some money? No. If your pharmaceutical company is in urology and women's health, you're probably going to be shopping around to keep your sales force working with women's health products. You're not going to go after a new epilepsy drug just because it looks good. That's not where your expertise is. Whereas Dr. McCarty over here is into the neurology stuff, and you know he sees a great urology product. Well, his whole sales force is devoted to neurology. He's not going to go after that. He's going to look for something else. So that if you're shopping around to Big Pharma or some companies and they say no, it's not because you don't have a good product, it's because you don't fit into some of the other stuff that they do. So when I speak about opportunity, you're going to get a lot of no's out there if you're developing a molecule, if you're shopping around, if you're starting a company, but it's just because you've got to go to the right people who are interested in what you're trying to do. So I've spoken about the infrastructure. They outsource discovery now. Do you know where discovery is for many of these companies? Medical schools, Johns Hopkins, MIT, Harvard, they're in everywhere, not just the medical schools. The stuff that you do on the lab bench is discovery. They have high throughput stuff that you will hear about, I think, a little by one of the speakers later on. The big companies can do that. They can take some of the stuff that you've done and don't be insulted if they say we have to repeat some stuff. You didn't do anything wrong. They just have to do it a certain way. We outsource development. I already told you that when we have these companies, um, PRA, RPS, Covance, Paracel, that do a lot of the routine back office work and just get trials done. And in licensing has been very, very upgraded. So I've tried in the last few minutes to tell you that the pharmaceuticals and biotech provide great opportunities for the scientist. It is much easier for those of you at a lab bench, at a medical school, here at the undergraduate level to have an idea, a molecule, and find people who are interested in it. There's a lot more resources than there ever were before. What people need is some conviction and follow through. That's the thing that hurts the most, is people don't follow through and they get discouraged when the first person says no. It's not because you've got a bad idea. It's because, oh, I'm just not interested in that this week. It, you know what? For, how many of you have applied for a mortgage? Okay, well, maybe not that many yet. But have you ever applied to five mortgage companies? Your credit rating is fine. Everything is good. Two companies say no, because we're not doing those type of mortgages this week. It's the same thing in the biotech industry and the pharmaceutical industry. No, you've got a great product, but we're just not interested in it. Sometimes it's silly, but... Uh, great opportunities for the physician. In my professional career, I'm trained in internal medicine and neurology. I saw the treatment of epilepsy go from three molecules that were 50 years old to over 20 molecules. That's tremendous opportunity for patients. Tremendous. If you have epilepsy, if you're on some of those old drugs, you're on the wrong drugs now because there's so many better ways to treat that. And in my career in, in psychiatry, I've seen people go from the traditional eight medicines to some brand new stuff. And rheumatology was revolutionized, absolutely revolutionized by monoclonal antibodies. Not only has it made it easier to treat these diseases, but it has taught us a great deal about the diseases and the immunology. And a lot of that teaching came 
came from the companies, I don't mean the marketing arms of the companies, I mean learning what was happening in real life in patients and then bringing it back. There is so, I could give you a two hour lecture on the immunology, not just of multiple sclerosis, but the things that have happened because of it that have changed the world. And it drives back here. And of course the investor, the investor doesn't know, you know, now they can pool their resources. You can get the $5 million angel investors. If you just have one molecule that you want to bring into one phase one study, $5 million is all you need. Okay? If you're doing phase two, you're going to have a different set of investors who may want the glory and glamorous stuff or maybe their bread and butter stuff. But to the investors, all of these guidelines provide them an opportunity to come to smaller companies, to develop drugs, and to have a better understanding of what the process is. They still need experts, they still need people to help them. And above all, you can't be afraid to take a risk. For those of you who are on a lab bench and your experiments fail, you've taken a small risk. You're not going to lose your house, I mean, you're not going to do something stupid, but you, know, you, you, you can't be afraid to have something not work right. I can't tell you how many times I've done a clinical trial and there is always a surprise. I think it's Mr. Trump, to borrow from a little real estate, who said, when you're in business, you have to be prepared for anything. And it really is true. So you have to be prepared for risks. And the other thing, I think this is my last slide, is many of us in, I started in academia, and the intellectual pursuit is very, very gratifying. You can publish paper, you can advance the scientific world. Then you want to go to the next experiment and find more. It's also very exciting to bring these molecules into humans. That's where you branch. Because while it's interesting to do some of these other experiments, those other experiments don't always help you bring that drug to a human. I was asked to give a lecture because I've worked for a German company, a French company, a Japanese company, one other, oh, South Korean company, an American company, to go talk to them about culture differences. And trust me, I've blundered through some of them and I've made some mistakes and had many successes. But the biggest culture difference I found was people who were in the R&D mindset and wanted to do just one more experiment weren't really prepared to commercialize. It's not evil, people are not trying to steal from you. It's just the mindset of, okay, I'm done here. I now need to do these three. When I present to the FDA, they don't care about you know, your fibronectin research from 30 years ago. They just want to see that you did this rat experiment, this rat experiment, this monkey experiment, this dog experiment, six months, 24 months, uh, 24 days, etc. Not very glamorous. It's like doing a tax return. It's not glamorous, but it's necessary, and it's a success. And Eric Kandel is a great person. He was a Nobel laureate who founded a company so he could get more money, not only to try to develop drugs for Alzheimer's disease, but also to continue some of his research. Um, and I'm going to now hand the microphone back to others. I will be around.